I'm really excited. Um, I showed you some peacock uh, butterfly caterpillars which are on the nettles up the lane, uh, the farm track. But look who I've got here. I'm so pleased. Here's another one here. So these are small tortoiseshell caterpillars and they they too like nettles as a food plant. You can see here this kind of stuff all over the leaves. That's that's basically kind of caterpillar poo and detritus and shows they've been feasting here too. There were lots on here. They kind of cluster up like the um, peacock caterpillars do in order to kind of stay protected and they, they look like a sort of much bigger uh, creature. These are actually, you can, I don't know how well you can see, but they, these are actually little tiny molted skins. We've just had a big lump of rain actually, so I think that's, they probably all um, migrated down to the lower parts of the, the nettle and just a few brave souls out here at the moment but I'm really pleased. I have seen some small torty butterflies around and uh, it just goes to show that if you, oh there goes my bin lid, oh here's another one, if you encourage predators into your garden they do actually do a really good job of keeping down the plants you perhaps don't want quite so many of. So just wait and see what happens. Honeybees on my bindweed. see here that this geranium has lost all its flowers um, and these are the seed heads um, oh, so that's not terribly good and these kind of uh, that's why they call cranes bills because they've got these uh, seed heads but you can see how they spread their seeds they sort of pop up like this and inside there are oh, the seeds so they've all popped out this is why I end up with so many self seeding I can see the seeds in there so I'll be collecting these up but if I cut back there's the seeds in there if I cut these um, geraniums back they'll give us another flowering which is always very welcome because as you've seen previously the bees absolutely love these geraniums so I'll collect some of the seed heads to put in some compost and um, or maybe just spread around in some of the bare patches I've got and uh, meanwhile I'll go and get the secateurs and pack these back to the ground. I'm going to cut this one back as well just because it's flopped a bit with all the wind and rain we've had. Hello Rhubarb, are you interested? Hello, you want to eat them don't you? So although these have got a few flowers left on them that you can see they're kind of starting to go over now. So again I'll cut all this back and they will grow up again from the base which is down here. Here's 
here we are huge pile of cut geraniums uh, not all of the seed heads are right but quite a few of them are so and some of the few of them are on the way now obviously all these you saw my video in a previous vlog where we watched the bees hopping from flower to flower and you know plant to plant so these are all cross pollinated so I have no idea what these seeds will do regarding the plant they produce but that's the fun of it and this is what I love about perennials kind of proper perennials rather than anything too rarefied you might find in a garden centre this is why it's so you know so good to sort of swap plants with friends and neighbours because you get all sorts of combinations which um, you know could be quite surprising and you end up with plants which actually do really well in your conditions so I would always recommend swapping seeds, swapping plants. So I will dry some of these and then if anybody's interested in having some wayward bee geraniums, let me know and I'll post you some seeds. Oh yes, I wonder when you lot might find the seeds. honey bee there. Really working these flowers. See her going round and round sticking her proboscis into the nectaries which are situated right at the bottom. You see those beautiful guidelines on the petals which Obviously to us it looks purple and kind of a, what's that, kind of red colour, deep red colour. But for the bee they see them in a completely different colour spectrum. See a little proboscis jabbing into them. Here's a hoverfly. You can see she, that one's just sitting on top. A oh, fly has a kind of sticky pad, so it just has to sort of suck up the nectar. This hen here, Cassandra, is broody. Now, we know that because she's making that noise, puffing up like a porcupine and it will probably peck me. Basically this is a broody hen, the size of her. So I don't really want her broody because she's making the other hens too scared to come up in the nest box and I don't really want to brood any more chicks this year because I had quite a successful hatch with Karen here so I've got those there so I don't really want her going broody so I've got to try and dissuade her from doing so and the way I do that is basically just put her in a put her in a pen where she can't hide up here in the dark and as I've caught her fairly soon uh, it shouldn't take it should only be a day or two before she's back to her usual bossy self. I've given her some treats in with her food just to encourage her to eat and um, 
Wendy and Hazel are a bit interested in that. But she's fine. She's got some water and some grub. And she can have a dust bath and just kind of um, get herself out of this frame of mind. Poor Karen looking a bit bedraggled in the rain. Chickens always look such such a mess when they're wet. Ducks, on the other hand, are absolutely loving it. Aren't you, boys? The proverbial water of a duck's back. I'm having to do voiceover because I um, recorded this with Downton Abbey rather loudly in the background. Anyway, so I'm just getting the dough out. It hasn't been proving in the fridge, which I probably should have put it to prove in the fridge. But anyway, so I've just got to shape it now into a square so that um, I can then fold the slab of butter up into the middle of it. <laughs> The idea here is to put the butter on, as you can see, on the diagonal compared to the square and then I'm just going to fold the flaps over and you need to completely encase the butter. It doesn't matter if the flaps kind of um, overlay each other but the main idea is to put the uh, butter completely centrally in the middle and then, and then fold it over with the dough. The reason I should have put the dough in the fridge was because the dough is actually quite warm and soft and that warmed the butter up. 
and the whole point of croissant dough is that you keep the whole thing cool at all times and kind of keep it as chilled as possible. So you fold it up like a kind of you're folding a letter. So fold it into three and then pop it back on the tray and put it in the fridge to chill right down again. That'll make it much easier to handle and stop the butter peeping through. Once it's had a nice time to chill in the fridge, so at least half an hour, I think I left this about an hour and a half, you can then take it by the short, take it from the short end and roll it out um, to about 60 centimetres long and 20 centimetres wide. And you're just going to fold it up again like a letter and pop it back in the fridge. And then you're going to repeat this one more time. So in total, you'll have done three folds. So the time when you first fold it, then you take it out and do it again, which is what I'm doing here. And then we repeat that once more. And then after you've chilled it, then, then it's ready to um, cut into the croissant. So it's the next morning and um, I'm having a gallon of tea. Um, these have been in the larder overnight. I didn't put them in the fridge because um, it's an ant. Didn't put them in the fridge um, because it's get they get so cold in there and I just wanted to give them a bit of a chance to puff up. So I'm doing from an egg here with lots of shell. Also, I'm half asleep. Um, and a bit of salt. Mash that up a bit. And the oven's been on the background for a bit. Um, it needs to be hot up and then it needs to be on for quite a long time not just sort of heat up like you'd normally let it, but sort of really, really get properly hot. So I'm gonna put this egg wash on, and this is where you get the lovely sort of um, stripes. I'm gonna move these over to another tray, um, as in split them up, because they're a bit tight on this tray. <laughs> just come out of the oven. Oh, those ones look a bit um, caramelised. They'll be the ones I'm eating. Anyway, they're really good. They've definitely puffed up more than the, um, the ones I baked last time. So I think keeping them in the larder rather than the fridge overnight worked really well. So I... Um I think with these ones, as I said, I didn't put them in the fridge overnight. I kept them in my larder, which is behind me. And it was quite cool yesterday evening. Um, and overnight, I think it was down to about maybe 12, 13 degrees. 
Um, I'm guessing if it's any warmer than that, you would want to put them in the fridge. But they've definitely got better lamination having not been um, refrigerated overnight. Um, Sado croissant, they're lovely with jam, but my son and his admittedly French girlfriend did um, say that they were, work really well with cheese and ham as well. Um, so maybe the sourdough adds kind of makes them a little uh, better for more savoury fillings. There is some sugar in the dough. I've linked the recipe in the description box and it's it's a really straightforward one. It's from Shipton Mill uh, where I get my flour and uh, it's just one of the community recipes but it's it's really good. But hopefully having seen it on the uh, video it'll encourage you to give it a go. It's really doesn't take a lot of time, it's just something that you need, as in, you know, the actual putting together of it doesn't take time, but you do need to allow a fairly long stretch to just do the different stages. But it's really forgiving because you just chuck it in the fridge to cool down between rollings. Um, so, you know, ideal for a rainy Saturday or something like that. In the recipe, uh, they've uh, taken three days to do it. I actually did this obviously in two, so I started it early yesterday morning. Now I've got a rye starter which which tends to be more reactive than a white one, so I fed my starter um, four times in quite quick succession. I took about half of it out to start with and made some sourdough crackers, and then um, I fed it, you know, a tablespoonful of flour kind of pretty much every hour until I was ready to bake with it. You really have to kind of kick start the starter and get it really really motoring in order to to deal with all the um sort of fat that goes into the dough um and i use my mixer uh rather than kneading by hand and i did the sort of richard Burtnett method where i um did sort of four minutes on slow and then I, it only took about five or six minutes on the on the faster speed to get it for it was sort of cleaning the sides of the bowl so i used i used that um, but now I'm really pleased with them. I'm going to have to cut one open in a minute and see what it looks like inside. <laughs> cut open the croissant. I'm using one of the burnt ones which I'm going to end up eating. Oh! Look at that. Pretty good, eh? concludes this week's video. Hope you enjoyed. Um, I don't know what I'm doing next week. My daughter's come to stay. Uh, she's come down from Newcastle. So uh, there'll probably be some baking and um, I'll be out and about in the garden and more chickens and that kind of thing. So hope to see you then. Mm -hmm.